Okay, so what I want to explain uh, in this lecture, so this is much more, uh, I assume, much more background in this lecture. Uh, so it's geometry of linkage. with uh, Simon Rich. So what I want to explain is a, a proof of the a kind of topological proof of the linkage principle, which I think has, um, well, it definitely has um, other applications and I think it will have further applications. So maybe I'll just wait for people to come in. Okay, so, yeah, so, and basically, so I wanted to talk about a result that's ba that w had its genesis in trying to write these notes for the CDM. Um, so I'm very grateful for being made to write these notes. Um, so I think that one of the most significant things that happened in the last uh, 50 years in representation theory is Bainance and Bernstein localization. And this is the statement that if we have G, so a complex semi-simple E algebra, then first from the perspective of compact Lie groups, we're interested in the finite dimensional representations of G, but then following the work of Harishandra, we're also interested in the infinite dimensional representations of G. And then we get very, very interesting questions um, concerning characters, etc. Characters and categories. And and what Bailey's and Bernstein localization tells us is if we consider um, D modules on the flag variety, so this is um, systems of linear partial differential equations on the flag variety, and we take global sections, this gives us an equivalence with a certain central quotient of the enveloping algebra, of our, of our Lie algebra. Uh, and why is this kind of totally revolutionary? Uh, if, you, if, if you're an algebraist and you start with, for example, the Lie algebra SL2, you m might, as we teach our students, you classify it simple finite dimensional modules. And then you might, for example, try to understand its weight modules or something like that. And you get these nice answers. And so then you might think, oh, okay, I'll classify all simple modules. And this uh, turns out to be rather difficult, but you don't know if you're just being stupid or not. But if you look on the other side of this, um, here's a construction of a simple module for um, D modules on P1. I can take P1, I can delete 77 points, put some crazy irreducible representation of the free group on the complement, and then take some take an IC extension of this local system, and then here I'll get an irreducible um, a D module which will give me an irreducible representation of SL2. And so somehow the geometry of P1 is fundamentally tied to the representation theory of SL2, and so we can suddenly decide what are reasonable questions and what are not. So it, I think it totally changed the way that we consider modules over Lie algebra, this, this theorem. I want to contrast this with um, the geometric Sataki equivalence. Okay. So G over K 
is our um, reductive group from before. And because I want to put it here, I'll write the necessary things over here. So we have G, and then we consider the um, dual group over C, the dual group, Langman's dual group. We consider the affine Grassmannian. This is, um, this is kind of, so this is an in scheme. That's so it. Um, limit of projective algebraic varieties under closed embeddings, and it's a kind of algebraic model for the, for the loop space of G check. So an example would be if G check is SL2, then the affine Grassmannian is, has a cell decomposition with one <laughs> affine space of every dimension. And the topology is such that if I close up, for example, C3, I get this subarray, I, um, I get this set, which is naturally a finite dimensional um, subvariety, finite dimensional projective variety. Um, but I should warn you that here the gluing maps are very complicated. So this looks like it could be P infinity. P infinity also has one zero cell, one one cell, et cetera. But it's, the gluing maps are rather complicated. Uh, and so this space is just absolutely fundamental um, space in, in modern geometric representation theory and also in, um, in number theory. So the geometric Satake equivalence is that our category of representations from the last lecture So this is a tensor category this is equivalent to uh, a certain category of perverse sheaves. So this is an equivalence of tensor categories. And you can think about both of these statements as being, so if we restrict to certain D modules, we can understand these as certain, as certain perverse sheaves, as constructible sheaves. And so these are both topological avatars of our representation theory, but they're rather different. So here, the, um, the connection between the two sides is direct. The basic calculation is that if I take the global sections of differential operators here, I get this this algebra, and here um, the connection is highly indirect. So basically every aspect of this is difficult. Um, so firstly you need to know what perverse sheaves are, that's difficult. Then you need to be able to define this convolution structure, that's difficult. Then you need to be able to show it's symmetric, that's really difficult. Um, and, you need to, and then you need to recover the group, that's okay, but then you need to show that the group is this group, and that's also difficult. Like every, so the proof of this is three pages, very dense, and this can, depending on the accounts, it can go to 100 pages. So the connection is um, Tanaki and formalism. And probably you can guess that um, this side is easier because here there's no Langman's dual group. So this is some piece of Langland's duality, and I guess you expect Langland's duality to, to be difficult, um, is opaque. Okay. So it's, it's, it's totally bizarre in the sense that you don't actually, don't actually construct a functor in either direction. Uh, this is block by block, so here we already see the appearance of central character. And we can understand other blocks by considering certain um, twisted differential operators here. 
And here there's um, the so, so there's up until now there's no there's no proof. So what I what I want to explain today is a proof of the linkage principle, uh, the block decomposition of this category. Uh, but and so up until now that has not been known. Um, Yes, exactly. And here, um, you know, as, as I hope was clear from the last talk, I'm very much motivated by understanding the Lustig character formula and its generalizations over here. Um, here, the analog is the Kajnan Lutzik conjecture. And here it's basically kind of, it, this equivalence tells you what you need to do. It's then not so easy to do it, but at least you know what to do. Whereas over here, um, I don't think it's clear at all, kind of. I think that it was an early dream when people proved this to use this statement to attack the listing conjecture, but um, up until now there's been no way of doing so. So, so now I want to change gears entirely and discuss equivariant localization. So the philosophy of localization is uh, if S1 acts on X, then the philosophy is that numbers, vector spaces, or categories associated to X should be related to numbers, vector spaces, or categories associated to the fixed points. And just a silly example, is that uh, you know, under certain reasonable assumptions, the Euler characteristic of x and its fixed point, so this is a good number that we can associate to x, agree, and this is because the Euler characteristic, so S1 can have two types of orbits on x, either the orbit is a fixed point or it's um, a circle. And a circle has non-trivial Euler characteristic. It has zero Euler characteristic. Now, Smith theory is the philosophy that. Uh, S1 should be replaced by mu p, or a cyclic group of order p, um, when taking mod p coefficients. So a silly example of this phenomenon is that if mu p acts on a manifold or a CW complex some, with some finiteness conditions, then the Euler characteristic of X is the same thing as the Euler characteristic of the fixed points. Now mod P, and this is because, so now mu P can only have two different types of orbits. It can either be a, a fixed point or a free orbit. So. If the orbit is non-trivial, then it's necessarily a free orbit is zero mod p. Okay. But notice that here we get a slightly weaker statement than over here, namely we have to consider this mod p. So what's kind of interesting 
And I learned from David Truman, and I'll talk about his work in a second, is that actually, so historically, um, the case of S1 was actually deduced from Smith theory. So apparently in Borel's paper, he, he takes a large mu p inside it and applies Smith theory. So now we come to this fundamental definition of Truman. So suppose that um, mu p acts on x, then we define the Smith category of the fixed points So we also assume that the characteristic of our coefficients is p. So the Smith category of the fixed points is the equivariant complexes on mu p. So here, generally it's a little bit complicated to say what an equivariant sheaf is, but if we have a finite group and the finite group is acting trivially, then this is just equivalent to sheaves of mu p modules. And what we do is we divide out by complexes with free stalks, so um, mu p perfect complexes. And then the fundamental lemma that gets everything going. So this is a kind of a little bit weird thing to, if you're not used to it. So the, for example, this is too periodic. Um, so the shift by two functor is isomorphic. The identity functor. Uh, takes some getting used to, but there's no time to get used to it in this talk. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, Yes? Yeah, I want to do a colored version in a second. So this is just, so in a second, I may as well do it now. Uh, yes. So imagine that C star is acting. So this is actually the, 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 the crucial definition for us. It's a slight variant of Truman's definition. So we, we consider Smith C star, and then we replace this with C star. So this is those C star equivariant complexes such that the restriction to The technical detail, um, extremely important in practice, but Say again. Ah, yes. So, I mean, I consider complexes here such that when I restrict to mu p and apply this equivalence, I get this. Is it clear? So this category is those f such that f restricted to mu How can a piece of chalk just vanish totally? Um, the restriction from C star down to mu p of f is mu p perfect. Yes. Right, but I'm asking oh, what's the next part of the statement was before you added the rest, it's isomorphic. 
Yes. So something else no, that does change. Uh, so, oh no, yeah, no, C star, yeah, C star. That's fine. That's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah that's fine. So uh, X is a topological space? X is a, well, in a second it'll be an algebraic variety with an algebraic action of C star. Um, but at the moment, it can be, let's say, a pseudo manifold or something, or just a manifold with an action of mu p is fine. But then C star can be the place with the circle, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this is a really, uh, it takes some getting used to, but it's a really, really uh, interesting and nice category. Um, and the lemma that gets everything going. So this is Truman, is that if we denote the inclusion of the fixed points, and if F is a DB, is a mu p equivariant complex, then we have a forgetting the support map. So we have two ways of restricting to the fixed points, which are usually different, but this becomes an isomorphism in Smith. And similarly for the equivariant case. What is the rough idea? It's essentially the same reason as over here, that the complement consists of free mu p orbits. So the, the cone of this map is, is calculating something like the cohomology of the complement. This has a free mu p action, so I can represent it by a perfect complex. And this is a, you should think about this as being a kind of miraculous self-dual way of restricting to fixed points. And then uh, one of Truman's principles is that this functor commutes with anything you want it to commute with. And y the principle sounds crazy, but then you want it to commute with something, and then you look at Truman's paper, and it just does, and so then you're happy. And then at some point, you start to believe this principle. Uh, Yes. So maybe if you're intrigued on the bus home, you can check that Smith C star of a point is equivalent to Kx plus or minus 1 dg modules, where this has degree 2. So you can think about this Smith category as being a certain localization. So if we didn't put Smith here, if we put the C star equivariant derived category, then we would get some DG modules over a polynomial ring. And here we localize. And also, this looks like a field. This is something like a graded field. And so it's rather simple, simple thing. Okay, so now we want to apply this back to the affine Grassmannian. Have I cleverly used the, yeah, I have. So remember our affine Grassmannian from earlier. So the key observation. So I think I learned this from Bezra Kavnikov, and I'm not sure when, but I've kind of ever since then, um, I've wanted to use it for something. So this is the loop rotation. So when, when, I, was, when I wrote this as a quotient like this, then this sends lambda t to
and we can ask what are the fixed points. So remember the Smith, so we're looking at, represent, we're looking at some kind of sheaves on the Alfine Grassmannian in characteristic P. And what Smith philosophy tells us is that we shouldn't take fixed points, but we should take new P fixed points. And what happens when we do this? So this is a disjoint union over, so I'll use some notation from the last talk. Chi, so chi was our character lattice. So chi is the character lattice of G, so it's the co-character lattice of G check. And the fixed points are homogeneous spaces for the pth power of our coordinate. And this is, um, I'm going to denote this Kura gamma. So I get finitely many, um, finitely many connected components in this fixed point locus. And if we think about something like, I'm not sure if this is too small to see. So here would be an SP4 example. So they're given by weights inside this region, and for a, for, a weight with no, for a weight that's on the interior of this region, I get, get a copy of the affine flag variety, and for weights on the edges, I get affine Grassmannians, I, so I get some homogeneous spaces that interpolate between the affine flag variety and the affine Grassmannian. So I'll write that down. So EG, GRU, zero is what some people call the thin grass bunion, and GRU of a regular weight is a fine flag variety. So this looks remarkably similar to the block decomposition. So the block, I mean, compare with the block decomposition of the last talk, So can we play spot the difference? Sorry? The dot, yeah. Okay. And that absence of the dot has worried me for about five years. Uh, so theorem, how to, so this theorem could be called how to make the, the dot problem go away, but it's also a very good theorem for other reasons. Um, so it's 40% Boston and 60% Massachusetts theorem. Um, Bezrukavnikov 
Merkov, uh, Bezor Kavnikov, Gates degree. Merkovich. Rish, Ryder. So it's 40% Boston, 60% Massachusetts, and 80% US. Um, it's the statement that there's another realization of the Satake category. is equivalent to so-called Iwahori Whitaker So this is called so this is Iwahori Whitaker It sheaves and how here we need yeah, I find Grassmannian to be defined over. So we take our group. So I won't go into the um, details of the definition of this category, um, but it n needs in an essential way the Art and Schreier sheaf. So we should be in characteristic P, and we need to replace G check with a version of G check over. Um, FL bar for L not equal to P. So this is a really remarkable theorem. You can think about it a little bit like if you take uh, Vial's character formula. Vial's character formula says that something easy divided by something easy is the character that you want. And going from here to here, and that's something that the denominator is the Vial denominator. And you can imagine this equivalence as something, something like multiplying by the Weyl denominator. And so it makes this rather complicated thing become much simpler in, in various ways. Um, also, this category is not, this is, a, this is a, the heart of a, um, of a derived category, but the derived category of this is not equivalent to the, to the ambient derived category, whereas on this case the side it is. Here there's a convolution structure, here there is not. So it has advantages and disadvantages on both sides. Because we need the art and trier sheaf. So there's a potentially topological definition of, of this category, but this is still um, <coughs> under discussion. I guess so. So the, the key p point for our purposes is that we get our plus row. Okay. So we have a hope that the, uh, this decomposition of fixed points, if we apply it to the um, Sataki on this side, in this realization, then the linkage principle pops out. And that, in fact, happens. Yes, it's really remarkable. You can deduce the block decomposition, um, like the actual block, block decomposition immediately from. So, uh, so you're talking about the right hand side. Uh, the next result uh, it gives the whole block decomposition. At the moment, the block decomposition is totally opaque. At, at the moment, the block decomposition on the right hand side is totally opaque. But in the next step, it'll become manifest. So what we consider of the affine Grassmannian. So this is where the right-hand side of the BGMRR 
equivalence lives inside this category, where this is loop rotation. And there's a key technical point for experts is that this loop rotation is the only GM that um, is compatible with this Iwahori-Whittaker condition. So if I want to do this, my hand is kind of forced in terms of what I can put here. And so we have this Smith functor to the Smith category for loop rotation on the Affan Grassmannian. where we take the fixed points under loop rotation. And as we saw down here, this has a structure looking like the block decomposition. And then this receives, this is defined as a quotient of the category, sorry, this should be iwahori Whitaker. of And so inside here, we have um, perv, and inside here, we have tilt. So the full subcategory of tilting perverse sheaves. And inside here, we have the full subcategory of even parity sheaves. So these are basically, this means stalks. and co-stalks vanish outside even degree, vanish in odd degree. Okay. And parity sheaves were in the title of these talks, and this is the first time they've appeared. Um, and similarly, you have a category of parity sheaves. even inside here. And you can either define it as the image of this subcategory or you can give an intrinsic definition inside here. And the theorem Yes. For the middle guy, the guy in the middle was Smith as well, right? Yes. But when you define Smith before it was the quotient of like some derived category by some like loop cycle form like Mhm. Yes. No, but I did that before also. Like, I, like, all I need to define this category is that mu p acts trivially. And before when I defined it, I took a variety with a GM action, and then I took mu, mu p fixed points. But that was just a silly way of saying I want mu p to act trivially. I mean, it's both silly, but I also don't know I don't know why I would consider this category if it wasn't taking the mu p fixed points of something. And the theorem is that this is an equivalence. And it seems to be quite remarkable. Um, it, it implies um, a number of things that I've wanted to understand for some time. Uh, so let me just give, so I should finish 25 parts, is that right? Or, Okay, I'll definitely finish by half past, yeah. Uh, like a picture somehow is that completely generally, we have this category and this category, and this Smith category is a localization of both of them. So you can think about this a little bit like the localization theorem in equivariant cohomology. So you have two categories and you have some thing that when you localize a whole lot of parameters, they become the same. Okay. So, it's a very general, general fact that this thing in the middle is kind of a localization of both these things. But what's remarkable in this case is that, um, that we actually get, get an equivalence of additive categories. So I just want to explain um, two consequences of this and then I'll...
So it's a really good question. Um, um, oops. I would love, yeah, anyway, I'll give up. Um, yeah, so it's an extremely good question. Can you see this? For example, so, so there are several analogous situations where you would like the kind of to, to put a minor, monoidal structure on the fixed points such that something becomes a monoidal functor, and I, I don't know here, and I think it's very interesting. Um, it's a little bit suspicious because this is not monoidal either. In the BGMRR equivalents, you lose. This is not monoidal. So still thin cases are indeed monoidal, right? Yes. Yes. Which? Well, it's this Iwahori Whitaker. Like normally it is, but we've put this Iwahori Whitaker condition, which destroys. It's more like a module. Uh, no, but we also don't on the left because this doesn't have a monoidal structure either. So you, you can get one by transport of structure, but it's not natural. So um, consequences. The first consequence is the um, linkage principle. So why is that true? It's enough to show that a tilting module, like the subquotients of a tilting module satisfy the linkage principle. But when I go over to this side, I have a whole lot of components. And an indecomposable object certainly may only live on one component. Because, so it's just uh, like, I said before, there's a component inside here that's the affine Grassmannian. And so then I get Iwahori Whittaker sheaves on the affine Grassmannian. But that's again equivalent to my original thing. And so then you can just apply self-similarity. So this mu p seems to give you a really remarkable self-similarity of the whole, whole situation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe just following Pasha's... Uh, anyway, I'll say that, say that at the very end. The second consequence is this Q arrow. Implies um, a character formula. The tilting modules... For all p. Okay. Um, so this was a conjecture with, with, that we made with Simon, and I discussed it to some extent in the last lecture. Um, but I somehow never in my wildest dreams did I expect just to have a proof for all p without any assumptions. We seem to, it, on the algebraic side, we always seem to have to make some assumptions, like p is not two or three or something like that. But it just seems to work totally uniformly. Um, and finally. a kind of philosophy is that these G check P to the L's, these subgroups seem to be extremely powerful um, and they're kind of like So in a, in a compact Lie group, I can take an element of finite order and then look at its centralizer. And sometimes it get very interesting 
subgroups. Okay, a simple example of this is taking an element of, an interesting element of order two inside SP4, and then you get SL2 times SL2. And these subgroups behave a little bit like levies, but are not. So this is Borel de Siebenthal. Um, and they're with their vial groups. Are these WLs from before? And so somehow the importance of these WLs is in, tied up with the importance of these subgroups. Um, so thank you very much. So the, basically, uh, so the conjecture with Simon was saying that the indecomposable parity sheaves here um, determine the tilting characters. Uh, so this is phrased in terms of the growth and group. This is the p-canonical basis in the anti-spherical module determines the characters of tilting modules. But now we just need to know that um, parity sheaves stay in decomposable under this arrow. Um, and that's very easy to check. So what were the Kaplan values in power distribution? So it's this recursion that I was talking to Fasher about, that if you want to describe the blocks, then now you have a situation for, um, for G check T to the t to the p, and then it's controlled by g to the g check t to the p squared, et cetera. 